don't know. I think I missed my chance. What are you doing? Life isn't fair, Shane. You go to school, you have big dreams. She's such a disappointment. You've started cooking again. How is uh? His name is Tapiwa. Bye, love you. He's the only thing I managed to do right in this life. So we're looking for 16 chefs to take part in the new season of Battle of the Chefs. You should enter, Mom. I, I really think you could win. This is for professional chefs. I wouldn't stand a chance. What is it? We've entered you into the cooking competition. What? Over the next 10 weeks, we'll be eliminating the weakest each week. Really good, Mom. Go big or go home. Are you ready for this? I'm going to kick your butt. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm afraid you're not cut out for this. We all agree. Only professional chefs have ever made it past the second round. I hope there's nothing too experimental in this dish, because you know we like our salsa the way we like it. I saw your honest is now in the TV. I'm here on Battle of the Chefs to just show what single mothers are capable of. When am I going to meet this Prince Charming of yours? You're not like any other girl I've met. You do your best. Believe in yourself. Good luck, Mom. Tapia really has his hopes up. I just feel like I'm way, way out of my depth. It's a good thing when people like you know their place. I didn't think you were a quitter. Maybe this was all a mistake. One last thing. I meant this too. And if it comes down to me versus you, I won't hold back. Hmm. Sounds like there's a little challenge in there. <laughs> you gave us a piece of charcoal on a plate, masquerading as chicken. You're the weakest chef. Bye-bye. Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with the cast of Cook Off, the first Zimbabwean movie to be streamed on Netflix. Enjoy this inspirational conversation. <music> Welcome to In Conversation to the Cook, cook Off um, show, uh, starting with uh, Joe going to Tendai Shem, uh, to Tendai and to Thomas. Uh, welcome, guys. I am so excited to have you. You have no idea. Uh, I've been looking forward to having you on this show and so excited for uh, the waves that uh, your show, your, 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 your movie, rather, is... Uh, is uh, uh, having all across the world. So welcome on to the show, all of you guys. Thank you so much. Let Pleasure. Thank you, thank, you. thank you. Excellent. Let me start off with you, Joe Njangu. You are the, the, you are the producer. And I, I'm, I'm saying to myself, you have done a number of things. You have uh, six films under your, your belt. You have had uh, an, an international award. Uh, talk to me briefly about the journey that you've had as a, as a film, film producer based in Harare. So it hasn't been an easy one uh, coming from a background where in Zimbabwe, we don't have an industry to talk about. Like we're a, little, we're a little film community where it's just different individuals running around in doing different things. And uh, it's been a journey where as a filmmaker, like uh, I remember like my first, from my first production, uh, Lobola, where it was the realization to myself uh, and the guy who produced then, Rufaro Kaseke, to say, let's try and do something to build an industry. Because mm -hmm. Zimbabwe was coming from an era where uh, film, there was a film industry, as they call it, but I don't believe it was an industry. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a, like a basket situation where film was used as a medium for communication. Uh, in terms of, like, you look at films like Neria, but where there were films about, let's say, new law about inheritance, and we yeah. need the message to get to the people. So they would throw in like a whole lot of millions of dollars out it, because film is being used as a medium for communication, to just spread message to the masses. And 
when that stopped, when the funding stopped, when the NGOs left, right, uh, then it all died out. And there was no industry to talk about because the, 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 it wasn't commercialized. So there was no continuity. So this was realization to, to see, okay, there's a big job to be done. Like it's a big road to walk, but it's willing to walk it and making the first attempt, the first step. So we made Lobola, I would say Lobola was probably the first commercial attempt at, at trying to bring about a commercial industry. Uh, and we, we, I could say we successfully uh, pulled it through because we, we managed to push like 100,000 DVDs. Mm. Uh, we, we, got it, we got it into the cinema then, there were still rainbow cinemas. And it's just been this road of, of knowing that, okay, we need to keep on pushing until we get to a level where we can say we have an industry. And with Thomas, so I've known Thomas for a very long time, and we've always been talking about collaboration, collaboration. Like this whole individualism, we can't really pull through because it's like, if I'm just doing this on my own, I can only do so much with one hand. But if it's two hands, if it's three hands, we're coming together, we can create magic. So Kukov is like a big prime example of what can be done if we put our hands together and collaborate, come together and see how best like we can try and turn it from a film community to a film industry. So, so uh, how, this is like a does, big milestone. How does uh, Kukov Tendai, uh, sorry Joe, uh, how does it compare to the other works that you've done before? How does it compare? Mm. Uh, with, with any works, right, uh, in our industry, we, we, we have a saying where you're only as good as your last. And with film, you keep learning, you keep... So, like, the way I made from, from 2010, making Lobola, to now, the stuff I have learned throughout the journey and putting it into the next production and into the next production, automatically, the next production becomes better than the next production, than the next production, because automatically you're growing and you're learning, because you keep learning as a, as a filmmaker. Mm. Uh, so, so, so every 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 work we put in, we put our best in it, and we we correct the mistakes that we made previously from the yeah. yeah so you get you get better with each uh, outing, as it were. Exactly, exactly. Thomas, Thomas, let me move over to you, Thomas Lutulu uh, Brickhill. Uh, you are a Prince Edward boy uh, who went to uh, study at uh, the Surrey Institute uh, Design and Art, and uh, you. Uh, Cook Off is uh, actually your debut uh, piece of work. Talk to me about that journey. Well, um, for me, I, uh, it's, it's been a long journey to get to making my first feature film. But I've obviously, you know, since uh, I, I've been working in film and television uh, for quite a long time. Uh, in the UK, um, I was a professional sound recordist for a while. Um, that's kind of where I learned camera, lighting skills, and very much in terms of, of my personal journey, I was keen to kind of try to learn as much as I could about the different departments that you have on a film set to really be able to put myself in a position of power when I finally got to direct my first film, that I really understood what every person's role was and, and how the whole team came together. Um, so in terms of, of, of uh, writing and directing, um, I've actually written a couple of other feature scripts before that. Um, but, you know, actually getting, getting a film to the point where you're now going into production mm -hmm. and making the film, that's, that's also a challenge in of itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, you know, I've had other scripts that I've worked on and other projects, but uh, there was something about Cook-Off, um, about the script for Cook-Off, which really captivated people, um, which really made other filmmakers, Joe included, you know, keen to say like, actually, no, let's work together. We can make this film. And what, from, what from my time- What is that something, Thomas? What is that something? I don't know, you see, I think often, often it's difficult uh, in terms of the kind, of, the, the kind of structures that Joe was talking about that mm. we lack because we don't have a film industry, mm. right? So in, in Hollywood, it's not like someone, even if they're a famous uh, writer, it's not like they just write a script and then they send it along and someone says, oh, great, let's make that film. Mm. You know, uh, people will look at it, they'll read it, and there'll be changes. There'll be multiple drafts of the script before you get to a point where you say, right, this project this is ready to go. 
Mm. So I think now with, with me, it kind of, that happened with multiple scripts. I, I, I was working on different things. And, and what I found with Cook-Off is that there's maybe there's something more, um, more commercial, more unique about the way that the story was told, or maybe my, also my script writing had just also improved over time. That meant that now when I was sending this script around, and again, th that's the, the draft of the script that we used to shoot the movie was not the first draft. Actually, a lot of feedback came from Joe, from other people, other filmmakers that I sent the script around to, to say, what do you think of this? And, you know, as I said, the feedback was like, uh, generally, wow, this is great, let's make this film. But that doesn't mean there weren't, uh, you know, tweaks and ideas that still came into the film in order to make the final product that, that you then get to see when you watch it. So I hear collaboration there, Thomas, plenty of collaboration with uh, everybody that eventually jumped onto, onto uh, making uh, Cook Off the movie. Totally. I think, I think a film is made by a community of artists. That's the best way that I could put it. And you really have to, you know, uh, to build a network in order to make a piece of art that is going to, you know, stand up, you know, and, and be noticed by people. Mm -hmm. So we were really lucky with this project that we managed to pull together a really crazy collection of artists to make this kind of grand collaboration happen. Uh, you know, from Joe, who I was, I was very much uh, uh, targeting Joe because <laughs> I knew from Lobola, from the gentleman, that here was a filmmaker who saw the same way as me, who saw that if we're going to build an actual film industry, something that's sustainable, something that's viable, we have to focus on commercial films that have a wide audience appeal, that are gonna, you know, travel well across borders. That's the only way that we're gonna build something that actually now we can all start to say, this is our livelihood, this is how we, you know, make our living. Um, but other people came on board from, from Tendi and Ten, um, you know, as our stars, uh, through to, to, the, to the musicians who perform, uh, you know, tracks that we, that we use for the soundtrack. Um, to Josh Changa in the art department, uh, Sebastian Lalamand, who is our director of photography. Um, there's so many artists who have to come together and be, for the, for the duration of making the film, be of one mind, you know what I mean? All together, all working towards the same goal. And then that's how you manage to produce something, you know, of, of, that just has... The, the benefit of all those artists working together on one single idea. Let me turn over now to, to uh, Tendaiche Chitima. You've got a Bachelor of Arts in Drama in Film, Media and Writing. You have featured, uh, you've had an ongoing role, uh, SABC3, uh, EC Demo. So you've made a name for yourself. Uh, and, and I was wondering, what made you uh, jump onto the script? So um, I, I have been on a couple of TV shows here in South Africa on SAPC uh, and another one on Santa Magic, which is fantastic. But like after I'd done a couple of TV shows, I realized that and I could see with the way the industry is built that it was important for me to continue getting exposure and especially roles in which I was playing a more lead role. Um, so that kind of pushed me to start looking at Zimbabwe as an option. One of my friends was getting married. Um, in July 2017 and I was going to be in Zimbabwe for a month and so I decided to ask Joe who was literally one of two producers that I knew in Zimbabwe I didn't know any other producer <laughs> and I only knew Joe because I had uh, auditioned for Escape like a year before and I'd never spoken to him ever again I think I don't remember ever speaking to him after that audition um, so now a year later, I decided to, to inbox him on Facebook and to ask him if he was working on anything that I could either collaborate or just assist on. Uh, and lo and behold, they were actually just about to start shooting uh, Cook Off and they were still looking for the lead actress. So it was just that desire to, to kind of continue getting exposure and hopefully get a lead role. When, when he told me that they were looking for a lead actress, 
I was so excited. I bothered him until he told me more information. And then he introduced, <laughs> me, and then he introduced me to Thomas. Yeah. Uh, and then Thomas and I were chatting over WhatsApp. We were on a WhatsApp group for like, I think a few days. Actually, I think it was just literally the same day I got the script or the day after I got the script. We had, we decided, both of us decided, yeah, we're going to be on the, I was going to be on the, on the, on the movie. So that was great. It was a great, ex- literally, I got the role, let's say on a Wednesday. I don't remember the dates, everybody, but uh, <laughs> let's say on a Wednesday, Saturday, I was in Zimbabwe. And then Monday, we started shooting. So it all happened within a week. Mm. Um, and, and but it was say, great. And Tendaiche, you say uh, uh, cook off the movie. Is, is a letter of love to Zimbabwe. Talk to me about that. How, how does it become a letter of love to Zimbabwe? I think it's a letter of love because it, it, it somewhat shows the essence of Zimbabwean people, the resilience that we have. It's a love letter, not only to Zimbabwe as a whole, but I think to Harare as well, the authenticity of the film. We're not trying to make a Hollywood film. We're making a Zimbabwean film about Zimbabweans, about ordinary Zimbabweans. And so... Even the way Thomas wrote the script, I think, portrays a very, just ordinary Zimbabwean lives, but the essence of who we are, the smiles, the simple things that we go through. Um, have you watched the film? I'm sure you have. I have. I've, I've, I watched the film uh, two, two nights ago and thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, uh, oh, great. You, you are amazing. I can't wait for Zimbabwe to, uh, to sample your talent. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. I, I, I Yay, thank you. Oh, but yeah, okay. so but generally the film itself just carries a lot of um, values that I, I believe Zimbabweans hold. So the perseverance, the underdog story about how um, someone who's least expected to make it makes it in life. And, and just the general family values that we have, society kind of supportive system that we have in, 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 in our culture also shows up with the grandma and the friends that she has as a character, as Anisu. And so I believe that it is a love letter to the essence of who we are as a people in Zimbabwe. Mm. Yeah. Tendai Nguni, uh, AK Ten Diamond. Where does the Ten Diamond come from, Tendai? Talk to me about the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before Cook Off happened and blew us all away, I spent the bulk of my creative life as a musician, a rapper, hip hop artist. And um, it was when I was in Australia that I got the name or that I came up with the name 10 Diamond. So initially my nickname was just Diamond. And um, I, worked at, um, I worked at a nightclub. So I was one of the promo boys. I'd stand on the corners. And while I was there, like I, I spent the whole night there. So I'd be giving out flyers and singing to girls as they came past and like rapping with the, 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 the guys I worked with. Um, and then when I started actually going into studio and making music, one of, um, one, of, one of the artists that I'd write with and write for started calling me Tendai Diamond, Tendai Diamond, Tendai Diamond. Mm-hmm. And um, being the wordsmith or lyricist that I am, Tendai Diamond didn't quite flow right. And then it became um, Ten Diamond with the H in the 10 because um, my my I guess my goal or like my my desire as as a creative has always been like I want to come back home and make it at home so I had the big H in there for Harare to, to remind me of like what was at the core of what I was doing so um obviously Tendai means give thanks so the whole name 10 diamond I kind of took it to mean you know be grateful but shine give thanks but shine so that's that's how that came to came about. Tendai you, you know you have been a victim of uh, Zimbabwean politics uh, in, in that you were in Australia and there was this whole noise about uh, uh, children of politicians uh, uh, should be sent back. You, your uh, visa in Australia was revoked and you finally found yourself in Singapore. You're back home now uh, as, uh, as a musician, as a, as a hip-hop artist and, and that kind of stuff. Has it been rewarding coming back home uh, today? It has been. It's been extremely um, fulfilling. I mean, funny enough, um, when all the political hoorah was happening I didn't actually get sent back so and it was weird I, I, I don't know why or how that kind of worked out um, by the time it had happened I kind of I I I pretty much dropped out of my degree I was spending more time in the studio hanging around with creatives um, and then it just got to a point where listen you know you're not studying obviously 
you can't stay here on a student visa. Um, I remember the month before I came home, I just finished my first project and released that. And then a month later, I was back home in Harare trying to, to figure out where to go and what to do next. Um, so that was, I think, late 2008. Um, obviously, things were not ideal. So that was pretty, pretty tough trying to figure out what to do. Um, and then nine months later, I had, um, I, had uh, I had an audition on Skype for this um, <laughs> performance venue in Singapore. And they were looking for someone who could um, sing and rap. And I happened to be able to do that. A friend of mine was already out there. Uh, so I performed, sung my heart out on Skype for them. And um, a couple of weeks later, actually, the, the morning that Michael Jackson died is when I caught my flight to Singapore. I remember this because I was sitting in my economy seat, literally crying because I couldn't believe what was going on. And one of the air stewardesses came by and um, I, I found myself bumped up to, to first class for, for my love of the, of, um, the gloved one. <laughs> You cried yourself you're into this class. That's a, that's a classic, that. <laughs> I was broken. Like, I, I have a handful of heroes, and, and most of them have passed, and it's just been... So, yeah, no. And um, so, I, I, yeah, I was in first, first class, landed, and I guess I kind of, like, dedicated my stay there to, to MJ. I spent 10 months there performing five nights a week, five shows a night, and it was incredibly... Fulfilled. It was the first time I was being paid regularly as a, as a, as a creative. So, for me, that was very affirming and validating because you know obviously um you know generally here the idea is if you're going to be an artist or a creative of any kind you're not going to make any money and i and i got to make some money i wish i had saved a bit more of it but it was um yeah it was a good experience mm. thomas talk to me now about the motivation for doing this movie and what message you wanted to put across uh in putting uh, uh cook off uh, show the movie um well i think one of the things that uh that I felt, um, and certainly that was one of the synergies that I had with Joe um, on this particular script, uh, talking about the film, was that generally the narrative that comes out of Africa, but and, and very specifically out of Zimbabwe, is, is this single narrative. It's like no one has anything else to say about us except for our political and economic woes. Mm -hmm. And we really felt that we wanted to, to tell a different story. We wanted to expand the narrative and show that that's not the sum total of who we are as Zimbabweans. So we were really keen to, you know, to tell something else, something, something. So uh, for, for me, then the idea of, um, of a romantic comedy, the idea of, a, of an underdog story, even, even the setting of it being set in a reality TV show, because obviously for us in Zimbabwe, you know, yes, cool, the Battle of the Chefs is a real show. It's actually on television. But for a lot of people out there, their perception of Zimbabwe, of Africa, for them to imagine that we also have reality TV is kind of like, you know, it's mind blowing for them because they just imagine us as, you know, a bunch of people living in a village. Uh, you know, the fact that we have a capital city and an airport and, you know, and TV and things happening. Uh, this is like, this is news to them. <laughs> this allows us as, as Zimbabweans to show that actually we are, we are normal, you know, in yeah. terms of global now of what's happening, mm. of, of the reality that everyone is living in. We are also part of that reality. Mm. And I think so th that really is where the, where the, you know, the initial focus, the inspiration to tell this kind of like feel good, uh, romantic comedy, underdog story came from. Mm -hmm. Joe, talk to me about, about that. You know, the, the motivation, the, the, the message you're trying to send across and, and what made you pick on Tendai, you shared to pick on Tendai uh, into, into, into uh, creating what, what is an amazing cast and crew for me. Um, so actually, uh, Ten, uh, Ten Diamond uh, was, was probably one of the first cast members in my mind that, that, you know, that I was really sold on, that I thought this is the person that I want to play Prince, you know, in this, in this cook-off film. Um, and we'd actually, we'd actually asked uh, Ten to come along and be part of a test shoot that we did probably <laughs> six months, a year before the actual filming. 
and uh, he came along, you know, it was just a day that we tried to do some shots to get an idea of how it would look, would this work? And I remember going back and looking at the rushes afterwards, and I, I said to Sebastian, um, who was the cinematographer, even then, um, I just said to him, look, this is Prince. Mm. You know, this, this is the guy, definitely. Mm. Um, in terms of, of Tendaishe, uh, really, we, we struggled because we, I knew that I was looking for something in a lead actress, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. You know, mm. there, there are good actresses. It doesn't mean that they're right for every part. Mm. Mm. Like for, in every story, there's a certain person who's the perfect person to play that particular role. And so we'd done casting, we'd cast a lot of the roles, but I hadn't quite found the person who I really felt should be Anesu, who could mm. bring that role to life. Mm. And that was really when, you know, Joe came on board uh, and said, look, I've, I've got an idea. Um, it's gonna be a bit sudden because, you know, she's not in Zim at the moment, but she happens to be coming here. Would you consider her for this role? Um, and so it was really then, you know, on the strength of like, you know, Joe's recommendation that he mm. said, no, I've seen this girl, she can act. Mm. She's really amazing. So uh, I had a look at the showreel, you know, um, and, and then we had, a, we had a discussion between the two of us, between me and Tendi, and I really felt like, okay, maybe, you know, let's, let's go for it. To be honest, for me, there was still one last thing which happened, and that's that we had we had a rehearsal um, with Tendi and Eugene uh, Zimbuzi, who plays Tapiwa, who plays the son uh, in the film. And obviously, I was very conscious that if the film story was going to work, then there had to be this kind of very genuine relationship, um, you know, between mother and child that felt real. Even though, of course, Tapio is a cheap, cheeky, you know, he's a cheeky <laughs> son <laughs> in the story. Yeah. But, you know, there had to be this real chemistry between them. And as soon as I saw them in that rehearsal, I was like, yes, cool, full steam ahead. Let's do this. Mm. Joe, oh. we, were to we were talking about putting together the cast, the crew. And uh, Thomas is, is, is just uh, uh, taking us through the journey of, uh, you know, finally landing on uh, Tendai, Tendai Shea as the, the lead actress, which is absolutely amazing. Is there anything you want to add to what Thomas has just said, Joe? Uh, I think, like, like, the point you, you, you said in the beginning uh, about the message, right? Mm. So when, when, when we started talking about, about Cook-Off with Thomas, uh, I had just come off this uh, program, like the Mandela uh, Washington Fellowship is done by President Obama, right? And in, in like the last week, so the last week of the program, we would spend it with the president, with, the, with President Obama, like with him in person, right? And he said something that's, that sort of changed my whole path. He was talking about the perception of Africa and how it's in our hands to change it. And he even pinpointed and said, it's in the hands of filmmakers to change that image. And he said, for as long as that African image remains like it is, we will continue to aid Africa and not trade with Africa. Mm. And then he went on to say, okay, where's your cell phone? Go on Google right now, type Africa, click on images. And he's like, what do you see? And it's mm. mountains, elephants. There was only one picture of a human being, of a little boy holding a, a yellow container, shapeless. And he's like, you guys are responsible for changing that image. And so, so Thomas doesn't even know that. Like, like he caught me at that point in my life. Like, I'm, he's only getting to, know, to, to hear that now. <laughs> I was going through that, that thought pattern of saying, uh, power we have as filmmakers, we mm. need to use it wisely. And for me, like, when I, from the moment I read Cook Off, I knew, like, that's the message that, like, it's like, imagine if someone is, is seeing something from Zimbabwe for the very first time. That's a beautiful, romantic story like that's a feel good story about mm. we, we also eat nice food in africa we also fall in love in africa mm. so it was like the perfect recipe it was like the perfect recipe for that so that was like part of the reason that really got me attracted to the project and i've been talking to, to tom like on different drafts before i was even on board as producer like we had, we had been talking like giving feedback and all that but for me the main thing was like cook off is the, this is the perfect recipe 
for to push to say okay and by god look at it that's that's been the first image that people are seeing on an international platform like netflix mm. so what it, 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 tendai share and uh, tendai you know uh, as i was watching watching the movies you guys upset me you know you, you, I wanted you to fall in love and uh, when we were breaking up, I got disappointed. And I'm like, what's happening here? Um, you know, talk to me, Tendaishi, about, about your role, the fun that you had with that, with that role. Um, you got into it and your performance was absolutely amazing. Talk to me about that, Tendaishi. Thank you. Um, so like I said, um, I was really eager to, to play a lead role. So I really gave it my all. Like, I was so ready. Um, but then also Tendai, Tendai is such a charming man. I'm sure everybody knows this. Um, so it was very easy <laughs> to, get along with, <laughs> to get along with him. And you're right, we did have a lot of fun. We spent a lot of time together. I think it, we really gelled and that really translated onto screen very well. Um, and also meeting like the different cast members, people I had grown up watching um, and people I admired from theater and things like that. That was really, really amazing. Kudzai Sevenzo, Michael Kudapashe, and Nira, like all those people coming together, Jesse Mungoshi, oh my, wow. Wow. Like, like that, was, that was great. So, um, so yeah, just having all those people around. And like I said, this was my first time acting in a feature film actually, and acting as lead. So the time spent on set was a lot. I saw so much of the process and what goes into making a film. And that exposure and experience was exactly what I needed um, in terms of just that extra edge, um, you know, building a character from the beginning to the end and all the different scenes, the different emotions the character goes through. Um, it's very good practice or experience for an actor to go through. So I'm really grateful. And I thank Tom and Joe for taking a chance on me. <laughs> Amazing, and and Tendai, share, uh, Tendai says you are a charmer. I mean, that's so obvious. I mean, uh, the the way you fell in love. I mean, uh, <laughs> talk to me about the fun you had in in in, in playing this role, Tendai. I um I when I wasn't okay. The most of the fun was literally on screen, but like when I wasn't on screen, I was quietly pretty nervous. I felt um I felt not out of place. But I mean, I'm, I'm a musician. That's like, that's my core. That's my foundation. And like for all intents and purposes, everyone, you know, you know, everyone there kind of knew me as this rapper. So I felt a lot of, a lot of pressure. Um, I'm, I'm generally a pretty shy and private person. Um, so for me, like I, I got to spend a lot of time with, um, with Tendi. Fortunately, she's who I was acting across and like she, she just made me feel really, really comfortable. I, I kind of looked at her more as like my, my acting coach the whole time. And um, we got to have incredible discussions the whole time we were there. We shared a lot of similar interests. Um, it was, yeah. I couldn't have asked for a better first film experience. It, nice. it would have been, I feel like it would have been really daunting and intimidating otherwise, because to this day, I'm still like Joe, Tom, you don't just go out and pick a rapper for these things, you know, but it's, it's worked out. And, and I'm also really grateful for the, for the chance that they, that they took on me. I mean, growing up acting had been like my, you know, my first love, but it's something that I never really, um, I never really had the courage to properly pursue. But when things came up, like an audition here and there, I'd, I'd go for it and never really land anything um, that made sense. So for this to happen was, you know, a surprise and a, a blessing, really. Mm. I must say kudos to you, uh, uh, Thomas and, uh, and uh, Joe. Uh, the, most of the acting happens around food. Um, and and uh, talk to me about what made you do that. Lots of the exciting action, I mean, the cook-off the cook itself is around food. Uh, what, what informed that? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, from, from the... From the starting point of, of when, as I was writing the script, I was, I was conscious that if the, the, this underlying theme of, of food and how as people we, we interact with food or through food, you know, uh, and, and that's like, as, as to say, our, our normal day-to-day -day interactions with other people are often 
you know, over the dinner table. Uh, that's where you have kind of family conversations. Or whilst you're cooking food, you know, th that's a good time when it's, it's not necessarily like a time that you, would, that you would show in a film. You know, normally maybe you, if people were going to be eating something, you would just cut to them eating straight away. Mm -hmm. But with cook-off, it really felt like, okay, if, if this is going to be this underlying theme of how does food interact with family, with friends, then we should try as much, or I should try, I guess, as the writer, to include it in almost every scene. Mm. So really, obviously, you know, the cooking competition itself, you know, includes food, mm. you know, in, at almost every point because it's a cooking competition. But really, with all the scenes throughout the film, we really tried to build the story that was told through people's interactions that also included food. Mm. Joe, do you want to jump in there on that issue? I think maybe like another contributing factor, like I don't know if you mentioned it already, but that the original Battle of the Chefs uh, TV show, he was the director of it. Uh -huh. so, 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 so that's where the inspiration even for, for, for the movie came from. Like he was very familiar with that world. Like that he'd been working on, the, on, on Battle of the Chefs from season two, season three. So he knew so much more about it, how to, like the excitement of it, how to even capture it on screen. So even hearing him explain, like, book of, like, the script, like, when I when we sit down, you just fall in love with the whole idea because it's a world he was very familiar with, yeah. Mm. Now, let's talk now, um, I want to, to put, to embarrass you all, uh, you're all divas, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> actors and actresses. Uh, can we talk about those uncomfortable moments that you had uh, this fight and the squabbles, starting with you, Tendaiche. What were the lows? What were the highs? The lows. Um, I mean, there were lots of like moments. Oh, like waking up early in the morning and mm. things. Um, <laughs> what else? <laughs> um, it was in winter, so it was really cold. Oh yeah. And I needed. I need. There's some scenes where I had to wear like, like not not things that were warm and then they would have to like put a blanket on me all the time um because when we went shooting um and then obviously i don't know like just generally like it wasn't it wasn't like a luxurious set mm. you know um because we're on a really tight budget so but then thank god i was just so focused and i was taken by this role that i it wasn't really something that i was thinking about all the time but really um yeah, just kind of being on set um, and just chilling, but there's not like much, like our green room was literally like in the, we didn't have a green room. We had like anywhere on set that she could find to sit. Oh yeah, we did have a green room though, eventually. That room um, at the back, yeah, okay. So, but it depending on where we were. The room is um, in the film. What's that? It even comes up in the film. It even comes oh, yeah, up in the film. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when, yeah. When the Ophelia is set. dash, 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 dash. You won't say what she does. <laughs> Ophelia does something, but we yeah. won't say what she does. What she does. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there were some low moments, but overall it was a great experience. Fantastic. Did I? The charmer? Um, my low moment, I know it very well. It was at some point, like we had this issue, like someone, I don't remember, I don't remember how it, how it now turned out, but someone was stealing stuff. <laughs> from the wardrobe, like off, off, on yeah. set. No. Oh yeah, I and remember. Like, I, I, I remember. I, oh yeah, no, that I remember was bad. Me one time, I was like, one of my favorite shirts. One of my you. Oh, that's got to be the low moment. But yeah, that day was that day was a very low moment. Someone's phone went missing. But oh. my favorite, one of my favorite shirts went missing. Yeah. I was just like, you know, this is I'm here to lose clothes now, and it was just like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there but was some one, no another point. one for me. There like, was a thing for um, said. There was a time where Tendi had to do. Yeah. There was, there was a time when, like, I don't remember which scene, but there was a time where Tendi had to do, like, one of the more emotional scenes. I think it was when um, she had to make a decision about whether she's quitting or not. Mm. And, like, I could tell Tendi was literally feeling that as oh, well. So that kind man. of, that brought me down. I, I, that brought me down as well. I was like, ah, oh, what can we do? But we don't need you cheered up. You have to be a bit low right now. But yeah. 
Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, Thomas, you, you, you know, um, Tendai has just said that this was not a luxurious uh, uh, set at all. Uh, talk to me about making a movie that's made it to uh, Netflix uh, on, a, on, a tight bu on a shoestring budget. Talk to me about that. Um, well, look, we, I think, obviously, you know, everyone would love to make a film with, you know, with uh, as much money as, as they think they need or, you know, uh, a, a kind of Hollywood budget or something like that. But we were very conscious of the fact that if we sat around waiting for that money to come, then we were never going to make a film. Mm. We, we saw an opportunity to, to leverage the fact that, you know, we could have a nice conversation with uh, Joseph Bunga from, from Battle of the Chefs and get access to that set. Mm. So we knew, okay, we can leverage the actual cash that we have to put much better production values on screen. So we kind of were, were, were leveraging everything to use this very small amount of money that we had to actually then make sure that we completed the film. In fact, the, the, the budget, the, the, the kind of uh, figure of 8,000 that often gets bandied around as in this is the money that they made the film with. Uh, and it's true, that's, that's the only cash we had to make the film, but really, all that paid for on set was was for for food, for fuel, for transport, for the yeah. cast. And sadza. Food. It was sadza every day, you know, <laughs> dollar sadza every day. Yeah. <laughs> actually, no sushi, actually, nothing. One one of my high points in the film was the fact that uh, during the filming, at the at the point, I think we'd now it was maybe week three of production, and you know, like at a point, it's like you really kind of eating sadza every meal. It's like, wow, okay, now it's kind of getting repetitive and stuff. And then this truck arrived at the gate. It was our one, um, you know, commercial partner who really, who believed in the project and came on board uh, is this local chili sauce called mm. Dr. Trouble. Mm. Yeah. And so Dr. Trouble came on board. He was like, cool, uh, I, you know, I want to be involved in the film. And he brought us two cases of chili sauce as a, as a like, donation. And then for the rest of the film, all of us were putting chili sauce chili so every day. <laughs> it was and chili sauce, literally. Wow. Yeah. Joe, jo, jo, talk to me about what is it that needs to be done in Zimbabwe to uh, give a boost to film, filmmaking? I think, think for one, uh, people need to realize the power that film has. I'll, I'll speak from a national level, like from a government level, where they need to realize that film, like look at what, what's happening right now. Hook Off is on Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's being shown everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's the representation of Zimbabwe that's on right now. Mm -hmm. And they had no control over that because they didn't even participate in that. But imagine if they did. Imagine if they were like, oh, one of the scenes, one of the scenes, let it be in Victoria Falls. And that's pushing Victoria Falls, that's pushing tourism. Mm -hmm. Film has so much power. And like, so there's no support at all from a government policy level, right? And then coming to corporate, like Tom is right, was talking about Dr. Trouble. Mm -hmm. Like there's brand placement, right? product placement in films. Like, Heineken, I remember reading this one time, Heineken made a billion dollars profit more a year it was in Skyfall because James Bond just took, took a bottle and drank. They had so many sales just because of that. So the, the power we have that they can believe and we can work together by pushing each other. Because we, do it, we did this with no money at all, with no support at all. So we need support. We need to realize that it's not, look at it like sponsorship, but it's, 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 it's like a partnership. Mm, mm. And we can push each other together. Mm. Tendaisha, do you want to jump in on that? What, what ought to be done to uh, give a, a boost to filmmaking in Zimbabwe from where you're sitting out in Johannesburg? Oh, yeah, definitely. I totally agree with what Joe is saying. Um, and just to add, I actually wrote my master's thesis. I, I don't know if Joe and Tom have read my thesis yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good for them to read, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but it was basically exactly about that, about how filmmaking can be a tool to build the national brand of Zimbabwe. And because I believe that we don't actually have enough research that um, 
that supports what we're trying to do as filmmakers. Exactly what Joe said. I just I wish we could have more research around that, so that when we when we approach um, uh, the parliament or whoever does the policies, to actually give them evidence. And I'm I'm sure Cookoff is a it's not like I see I was I was I was ahead of y'all. I used Cookoff as a case study. Now it is actually a case study, guys. Um, so we could use Cookoff as an example, like what what Joy is saying about how it's now on Netflix. We see the numbers, we see the exposure. That's that's possible. Um, so more research is important so we can have solid facts we can present to parliament so that you know legislation can change mm. also um we just need i think that could be a great a great um place to start but in general there is a lot of structure that needs to be to be put in place to protect artists and uh, and creatives so that so that they can build a proper careers in the industry Mm. Uh, without structures, without um, these legislations and everything, people will just keep doing hobbies. Uh, but that's not going to work because what we really need is structure that people can build on. And also, when young people look at careers in, in the filmmaking industry, they will be like, oh, yeah, actually, I know exactly what to do. I struggled a lot because after school, I didn't know where to start. You know, I was literally winging it the whole, entire way. But if there are more structures and more organizations that are supporting young filmmakers, young artists, and kind of helping them build their careers properly, that would be fantastic. And I mean, looking at South Africa, um, South Africa does a very good job. There are so many organizations, got, some of them are government owned, some of them are not, but they help artists to find their way. And also they fund artists and creatives. They, they have caught on this vision of using um, making and creative story storytelling to, to sell South Africa to the world and they do a really good job at it um, so if we could kind of copy those kinds of examples would I think would be well on our way um, yeah I, I think that's where I'll stop for now <laughs> and, I, and anything that you want to add on that what to do to improve the environment uh, and give a boost to filmmaking, which, uh, as Tendai has just said right now, it's, it's a product that provides a window into the country. Uh, it could lure tourists into the country. It's a, it's a job creator. Uh, what, what's your what's your addition to what uh, Tendai and Joe have just said? I would probably say, like you know, starting um, in in the homes, you know, and just how we how we treat and kind of view creators across the board. I mean, film specifically for this conversation, but you know, it, um, it goes such a long way to be able to see that, okay, if I get into film, there is some kind of a, a, a roadmap and runway there. But before you even get out there and say, I want to be an actor or any kind of artist, you know, in our homes, in our schools, that kind of societal encouragement, like, go ahead and do it. That's valid as well. I think in our society, there's, um, there's, a, there's a pretty big stigma around, you know, um, choosing a a a career in the creative industries and um and i think you know it all feeds into what uh Tendi is saying and what joe has said without those structures without those high level policy decisions no one including you know parents and relatives in general can see that you know what if we let this kid go ahead and do this it's going to bring about something meaningful meaningful beyond just following a passion or following a dream but mm -hmm. actually a career that can sustain them and sustain mm -hmm. it uh, but th Thomas, talk to me about uh, you know this uh, this uh, shoestring budget, which put you in an embarrassing uh, place, which became a blessing, uh, launching on a rooftop rather than in a cinema. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, look when when we you know when we had that that first cut of the of the film, which which then became our kind of uh, festival screener. Um, that version of the film, which has traveled for the last couple of years um, around the world, uh, we wanted to showcase that to an audience. We, you know, we wanted to to see what people's reactions would be, um, because you know, ultimately, again, going back to this idea of if you're going to create something sustainable, you have to also road test your product. You have to make sure that you know if there's any last tweaks and stuff that you have to make, which indeed in our case, we did make after that you know, initial screening. But you have to show it to people. You have to get that initial feedback. 
And obviously, we would love to have, you know, to have had that screening at a, at a you know, at a proper cinema. But at, at that stage, you know, with with there not really being this, you know, a long tradition of of successful commercial films yet in Zimbabwe, uh, it was very difficult for us to convince the cinema to say, like, you know yes, come and have your event here. So essentially they wanted us to hire out the whole place. We couldn't afford that, obviously, uh, with our, as you say, shoestring budget that we'd actually put the film together in the first place. Um, you know, we couldn't afford some, some thousands of dollars now to hire out the whole cinema uh, for this one single event. But uh, likewise with, uh, you know, throughout the filming process, uh, when, when we are, you know, set, when challenges are, are set before us, we take the Zimbabwean view and we make a plan. Mm. So in our case, you know, that meant that we pulled together some, some favors that we could to get a, a decent PA system, to get a projector. Um, actually, I'd been doing some, some book cafe events at the Ambassador Hotel on, mm. on that same rooftop mm. where we had the screening. And so hence, I'd, I'd built up a relationship with the manager that I could give him a call and say, look, can you help me out? We need a venue for, for our screening. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we put all those things together to, to, you know, to show the film to that audience for the first time. Um, I think, you know, for us, as I say, it, it's all about shaping that, that final product because, uh, Overall, yes, I, and, and, you know, I would like to go back a little bit to, to your question of, of, sure. uh, of funding, of, you know, of, of state support or whatever. To be honest, I really believe, you know, especially from my experiences in, in uh, music, in running Book Cafe, in that kind of arts, wider arts and culture space in, in Harare, in Zimbabwe, that, uh, yes, clearly there's, there's not a lot of, of interest uh, or, or understanding that arts and culture can be uh, an industry, that it can earn money for the country, that it can shape the narrative and tell the story of the country. You know, it's really sidelined as a small uh, cottage industry or something we don't really need to think too much about. You know, ah, these a bunch of musicians playing in a bower. You know, this is kind of how the, the perception from up to about what artists are trying to do. But actually, we're trying to do something much bigger than that. You know, we're really trying to, to communicate the stories of everyday people. And actually, I think at the end of the day, be it through music, be it through film, some of that comes from the idea of now figuring out how to commercialize it. How do you get the audience to pay for that product? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, for me, going back to the book cafe, I was always focused on the fact that, yes, you can, uh, you know, you can look at, at, at a band, at an artist for, for many reasons, but always in your mind has to be their commercial viability. Mm -hmm. Do they have an audience? Mm -hmm. Are they helping to market the product? Uh, are you ending up with, you know, with a full house with, with customers who are willing to pay for that show. And so the same with a film, you know, we really saw that we wanted to make a film that people would be, you know, would be keen to buy, not just to watch, but, you know, so, so that's, that's like the mindset that we had. And really that screening was, was the beginning, I could say, of, of the journey now that we then took to get to these international festivals, uh, to recut the film to a more a shorter, more commercial length. I think the, the current version of the film is is probably 15, 20 minutes shorter mm. than that original version that we screened on, on the Ambassador Hotel rooftop. Mm. Um, since then, the film has been color graded. Uh, we've redone the, the original score. We had a Zimbabwean composer come in and write music to go with the film. And then we had to have all the sound remixed in order to get it to the level of the product that, that we were looking for. So, you know, I think, I think, I don't know, I just wanted to say something about mm -hmm. the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, you have to still work to refine your product. Mm 
um, to get it to that level. So maybe it was a, a humble beginning for us to start on, you know, screening our film on a rooftop. Um, but really, it's, it's now, now you see that the product of that hard work is we managed to get a film on Netflix. Mm. Fantastic. Joe, do you want to talk to us about what it takes to get a movie onto Netflix? You are the first uh, full-length movie, Zimbabwean full-length movie to be on Netflix. What did it take for you to do that, Joe? I think it, it, it's, it's just like adding on to what Tom just said now about the amount of work put in and us on our own appreciating that, okay, we've pushed thus far, right? Uh, within our reach and means, right? And then I think I can even add on where we, 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 had, we had collaboration with other people that came on board even after the film was done, right? Mm. We, we had Zoe Flood, our amazing co-producer, right? And executive producer who came on board, right? At that stage and propelled and facilitated all the stuff that Thomas is talking about, put, bringing in quite bright films from Kenya, you know, guys from London to do the sound. And this is all with us appreciating that if we were to take this further, right? Net, we obviously know that Netflix, they have certain standards that they require, right? Uh, I remember uh, like we had, we had done the film originally with, 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 with ordinary subtitles. And here we are going to a stage where they wanted closed captions as they call them, right? Mm -hmm. And and Tom spending sleepless nights doing them, writing them down, right? Mm. So, so it's, it's that whole appreciation of knowing if you are about to enter a new level, there are certain regulations and requirements that are needed within that level, but are you willing to put in that work before? And we knew definitely we're not going to submit it as it was to say, oh, Netflix is a film from them as it was. We, know, we knew that it had to be at, at, at a certain standard. And that takes people again, that takes collaboration again. Now we have Zoe, like, who's, who did an amazing and still is doing an amazing job. She needs to sleep if she's watching this. She's been working like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> but Let that's, me jump that's, that's up that to you. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Finish up, Joe. Yeah, Finish but that's the whole point of us getting to a point to say, okay, now we're ready to present this to that premium platform and confident enough to say, oh, let's, let's try and we know, we know that they're not going to say the sound is bad. They're not going to say it's not color graded because we've made efforts to get it to that level. Mm. Um, Tendai Ishe, did, did you think as you were, um, you know, sweating in, the, in this uh, uh, shoestring budget film that you'll be on Netflix, Netflix USA, that you'll, be, you'll have this massive audience? Did that ever cross your mind, Tendai Ishe? First of all, I didn't even think I'd get the part on, on cook off. So that for me was already like such a blessing and I was really grateful. And then I remember when we finished shooting, Tom and Joe were saying, oh, we're planning on, you know, putting the film on DVDs. We're going to sell them around Zimbabwe. And I was like, yeah, cool. I think they were even low key trying to uh, do a, a tour or something like that, a screening tour around Zimbabwe at that point. Like, and then, and then we started getting into festivals. That was fun. Um, but to really think Netflix, I mean, I have a Netflix account that I watch. I remember the first day I, <laughs> the first day I realized I could see myself on Netflix. I was like, ah, this is crazy. This is crazy. I like, quite, cause I mean, I've been watching Netflix for a couple of years now. So no, I didn't think so. And when it did happen, I was just, it is unbelievable. I, even up until today, it's never, yeah. I don't know how to explain. It's just crazy. Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> Thomas, did you dream of this happening when you started? That this uh, cook-off show, the movie, would be on Netflix? Was that the, the, the driving force? Or this just uh, uh, happened? Um, I, I wouldn't say Netflix specifically. That, that wasn't the dream. But the dream definitely, you know, as, as from the very beginning when when me and Joe were, were, you know, shaking hands and agreeing that this was the project we were going to embark on. The idea was that we were going to try and make something of a level above anything that had been made, you know, in Zimbabwe in, in, the, in the recent years. We really wanted to set a new benchmark. That's, that's kind of why we talk so much about 
these many collaborations that we made in order to try and make that happen. Of course, we didn't, there are were, were no guarantees mm. in these things. So we didn't know for sure uh, if, if one of the big platforms would, would pick us up, uh, if we would get to that level. Um, but these are set, stepping stones, you know, even Cook-Off itself, it, you know, it's great that the, it's getting the support and the, and the love that it's getting since it's, it's been released. But it's not a perfect film, you know, it's what we could make with the resources that we had. So we knew like, we're gonna take our best shot. We're gonna make this film and make it as good as we can possibly make it. And then hopefully the dream was, if we've done enough, then that'll take us to the next level. That'll take us to the level where now people believe, oh wow, these guys are actually serious. Mm -hmm. You know, they can actually pull it off if they can do that with this small budget, imagine what they're gonna do once they start getting bigger budgets. And for us, that was the dream, is can we raise the bar enough that people take the whole film industry much more seriously and say, right, actually we can build something here. Let's invest some money into this because we can start to see the possibility of real returns in the future. So I, I wouldn't say Netflix itself was the dream, but obviously, you know, wow, it's such an amazing worldwide platform to be there, you know, to see Tendi's face next to Brad Pitt uh, as you are scrolling through the films. That's the dream. That's, that's you know, well that's done, how guys. we well put done. ourselves on an equal uh, footing with those Hollywood films. I am so proud of you. Sorry, Joe, go ahead. So <laughs> next to Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, awesome stuff and, and, and so now that um, uh, you, you know Netflix is recognition itself have, has the uh, movie had any other uh, uh, awards uh, what, what, what awards have you been able to collect so far if at all so Joe, do you want to talk locally, about it? locally it, it, it got uh, the best film Nama the best actress at the Nama Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Zimbabwe International Film Festival, it got Best Film again, mm -hmm. it got Best Actress again, uh, it's the Canberra Film Festival, it, it got the Best Audience Award, it got the Nancy Green, the Founders Award. Uh, Tom, can you add more? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> exciting stuff, guys. So th those, are, those are the awards that we've won. Um, but, yeah. you know, I mean, we've also, we've also been nominated for awards in other... Sorry, Tendi? Rotterdam. Ah, Rotterdam. Yeah, Rotterdam, you see now, th th that's an interesting one because we didn't win that award, but that was actually our very first festival. So mm. that was before oh. all the work that we've done to mm. improve the quality of the film, to really, you know, fix the picture and the sound and get it up to the right standard. Mm. And yet at Rotterdam, there were 187 films in Rotterdam Film Festival. And every film automatically in Rotterdam is included into the audience awards. Mm. And audience vote after every screening, you know, out of, out of one to five, how much did you enjoy the film? And then they collect all these votes together and they calculate. So mm. out of those 187 films, Cook Off came number 38. Wow, awesome. Oh, right? So, so we really felt at that point, that's when we knew not only that we had something, obviously, yes, we still had to polish it to get to that final product, but we knew we had something, you know, special. And also that our, our stories, our Zimbabwean stories travel out there into the world. You know, the, these, these people in Rotterdam, uh, in Cambria, you know, in, in California, as, as Joe was saying, we won two awards at this festival. Um, it's, it's crazy that our little story from Zimbabwe goes out there and is inspired by people with no connections to Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. simply because yeah. they see our stories, they feel it resonates with them, with their stories. Mm -hmm. So for us, then that's us showing, you know, that like we're, we're all people, we're all the same. You know, they shouldn't view Zimbabwe in, in this kind of like very stereotypical way, mm. but really understand that we are, you know, regular people. We have regular lives. Mm. All right. I'm, I'm going to close by asking each one of you one question. 
starting with you, Tendaishe, what next? What's next for Tendaishe now? Well, what's next is whatever Joe and Thomas are working on. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good and then, and then I'm, also, I'm also working on a one-woman play that's going to be premiered hopefully in Harare soon mm -hmm. when the lockdown is over. Mm. And I'm also currently working on a South African production with 10 actually. Mm. We're on a TV drama series, uh, Zimbabwean producer, but it's being shot here in South Africa. And it's also really exciting. Mm. And then obviously, yeah, just hopefully more big budget films in mm. my future. Mm. I receive, I receive. <laughs> yeah, you love that. Yeah. Joe, what, what's the next big thing for you? So, so we, have, we, have a, we have a big slate of projects. Uh, I, I can even speak like with Tom that we have even discussed uh, separately. Uh, when I say slate, it's like a list of, 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 of like concepts and scripts and like for, for feature films, TV series that we already have and are already pitching for. Uh, I, I shot another film last year that's coming end of the year, which I produced. So that's something that's coming on again. Mm. Tom, what's the next big thing? Um, well, okay. The, the, actually, the next, next thing is, is that we're not quite finished with this film yet because Netflix is just one of the platforms that we have targeted. So actually, we, you can watch this space. Uh, uh -huh. You know, there's actually more exciting news uh, that we already know, but we're I not yet wait. ready I can't wait. <laughs> to share with you uh, of the journey of Cook-Off, um, of where it's going. So, you know, there's still more, more work to do on this film to really take it as far as it can go. Um, but, uh, you know, after that, when, when all is done and, and we've really, you know, let the cook-off uh, plane fly as far as it can fly, um, then for me personally, uh, you know, there's a, there's a Chikwata 263 album that uh, we were kind of halfway through recording when the film kind of overtook things. So I'm, I'm very keen to get back into the studio and, and rekindle my, my own artistic dreams of, of being a rock star. <laughs> but as, as Joe says, you know, obviously we also, we want to make more movies. Um, we want to tell more uh, genuine Zimbabwean stories. And I think for me personally, something which is the dream, maybe not the next film because it becomes more ambitious, you know, the, the bigger your dreams become. But the one thing I really want us to do is to start making films about the future, you know, like sci-fi, because I really feel that we, as Africans, we don't get to imagine a future, you know? It's like we are stuck in the present or the past, but really I feel like this is the way we start to look forward. We, we're supposed to have a future. We're supposed to imagine, you know, uh, us Zimbabweans traveling into space, mm. uh, you know what I mean? Doing these crazy things. That's how we uh, get, you know, we have to give the kids of today dreams so that they can surpass us when they grow up. So, mm. you know, that in the long term, that's the dream. That's the dream. Wow. That, that's amazing, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, you know, uh, very inspirational stuff. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, hopefully inspired and inspire the, the nation to be above where we are at the present moment. So uh, guys, I, I wish you all the very best. I'm so proud of you. And I think uh, I, I speak on behalf of uh, all Zimbabweans uh, in Zimbabwe, on the continent, in the diaspora, you have put us on the map. map. So well done, well done. Thank and Tendaisha, <laughs> uh, we you. pray that the collaboration produces uh, more uh, lead actress roles for you uh, and you. and Joe uh, well done for the work that you've uh, you've put into this Thank and you. indeed it, that that slate of uh, projects may they come true um, Thomas you. Uh, you become a rock star make lots of money don't forget me when you become a rock star um, <laughs> guys, you you remain where you are let me address myself now to um, our our viewers who are in Zimbabwe uh, on the continent and all across the world in the, in the diaspora. To thank you for watching In Conversation with Trevor. To remind you that In Conversation with Trevor is a weekly show. 
Uh, we invite you to subscribe to In Conversation with Trevor so that you don't miss out on any of these quality shows. And uh, please press on this red uh, subscribe button here so that you get an alert every time we have uh, a fantastic show like we have. Guys, thank you so much for inspiring us. So to the viewers all across the world, until next time, cheers.